Avi Zev Wiener, American Santa. <laughs> Andrew Dan Carney, Between Earth and Sky. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Workman, Deciding Vote. Brother, a tattoo on my brain. Uh, uh, Dan Gibbs, a tattoo on my brain. Kate Davis, a tattoo on my brain. Katie Schiller, Between Earth and Sky. Raytha Reganathan, also Between Earth and Sky. Okay, why don't we hold the mic over there at the end. Andrew, do you want to join your team so that way you can all speak as one unit? Um, so amazing having everyone here, right? What a privilege. Oh my. So we're going to get some um, questions from the hall in just a little bit. But in the interim, I have two questions for our filmmakers up front. Um, between Earth and Sky crew, let's start with you. And this question is for everybody, so start thinking about your answer. Um, what was the catalyst for this film? Yeah, I hear you. What was the catalyst for this film? Sorry for the mic issues. And why now? Um, so uh, between Earth and Sky, Nalini is my aunt. Um, I grew up with her, like looking up at her like this superhero, uh, seeing her in all this media and you know Bill Nye the Science Guy and all these things. And um, you know I saw her as this kind of perfect uh, like uh, adventurer explorer. Uh, and in the in COVID, I uh, interviewed her on Zoom, just thinking I was going to make a film about her fall and recovery back to the state that she was at before. Uh, and then uh, we started getting into all of her life experiences and our family history. And I realized that it, it wasn't just about getting back to where she was before. It was about getting to a new place and thinking about what grows back after a disturbance, you know, inside of her and you know, in the environment. So um, that was kind of the impetus to explore that and, and think about process instead of results. And David and I had worked for years off and on with Sheila Nevins, who's, as everybody knows, is a force in the field and has um, I, I came across an incredible book called A Tattoo on My Brain. And we started having conversations with her. And um, I think David and I both felt like, well, well, first of all, very surprised that there is somebody like Dan Gibbs who really is both a neurologist and also be, sort of becomes his own patient um, and, and offers a whole perspective that now is being reflected in a new area in the field of dementia, which can help empower all of us. Yeah. I think Katie said it all. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, so our story is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, we had had a previous film that Jeremy had directed and I had produced. And some people came to a screening just like this, a QA, and a a guy named Jerome Steger who's in the, in the back row there, um, and his wife Sherry. And they had really enjoyed the film and, and met Jeremy after the screening. And he had brought us this grainy clip of George Michael's speech huh. and came into our office and, and called us and showed it to us. And we were just so blown away by this story that we had never heard of, we weren't familiar with it, he had remembered it and brought it to our attention. And then we went on this archival you know, research and our, our archival producer, I think it's in the audience as well, uh, Melissa Jacobson, and we found all this amazing rich footage and then met the Michael's family and, and proceeded to interview them over Zoom a lot through COVID and then met them all in person. And, and originally it was gonna be an archival film, but then we decided that uh, you know Jim and Sarah and Lee were all such interesting characters. We wanted to include them all and then we met Rebecca, who also is the archivist at this Cayuga Museum, who's you know carefully saving all this material. So that's sort of how it came about. Um. Oh, it, since we've got a crowded stage, can I just bring up uh, Ruth Messenger, who's this oh, legend yeah. of New York? <laughs> she uh, is featured cognitively, so I just want to bring her, but uh, thank you, Abby. Um, the catalyst for American Santa uh, was uh, last December, I was making dinner, listening to the radio, and I heard an interview with Stafford um, about Santa's just like me. And the interviewer asked him, uh, well, you know, about any pushback he would get because he was starting to do more mall stuff. Um, and, uh, and he told the story about uh, the little girl being so excited and the mother taking her hand and saying, that's not the kind we like. And then um, he says, and I can't even play for you on the radio the kind of voicemails I get every day. At which point, I, my head sort of like exploded and I just really had a vision of 
of seeing the magic that is, uh, I imagine was, was happening there and then hearing those voicemails. So I just basically stopped making dinner. I went upstairs, I looked him up, I sent him an email. I said, uh, you know, I would love to make a short documentary about this and I just outlined exactly pretty much what I just said and he, um, you know, invited me down after a, a couple of conversations and pretty much like two weeks later, I was shooting it. Thank you all so much for sharing. Oh, warm mics are really yeah. sensitive. Volume. I'm doing a stand over here, so that way there's no feedback. Um, I just have one more question, and it's for Ruth, and then we'll get to all of y'all in the audience. What was it like to... Wow. <laughs> so sorry, y'all. What was it like to share your story and trust the filmmakers with this project? Um, you know, it was just automatic to trust anybody who was interested in this story. I mean, before I really knew them, I knew about George Michaels, I knew about the boat, and I've used it, and you saw a quick clip of that, but I've used it in all of my teaching. I want to say that there is no more important moment in time to show this film in every place than right now. Differently. I pray we are going to have a lot of George Michaels. There are going to be a lot of votes. We've won some of them. We won some of them this past Tuesday. But there are going to be votes in every state on critical issues of not just the right to choose, but um, gay marriage, what gets taught in the schools. And we're going to need a lot of people who are willing to stand up and be the deciding vote. and having spent lots of time in my life saying, I want to tell you about George Michaels, not the singer. <laughs> um, when, I, when I heard from Jeremy and Ralph, I was like, okay, you're going to take my one of my favorite stories and put it on the screen, and I, I'm all in. Uh -huh. All right, let's get to audience questions. Uh, please just raise your hand really high, and then I'll repeat it for everyone here. Yes, over there. Yeah, you. I just want to thank Jeremy and Rob for making the story about my grandfather. Oh. And so, um, as a as Jim was my father is my father, uh, who was featured in the film. Jim is the rabbi, the rabbi. who's a retired rabbi yes. who's now uh, he's featured in the film. Yeah. Yes, and you know there was one poignant moment, and if I'd like to share this, I've got two seconds to share this. Just go Becca, my cousin, is also in it. And she was the only granddaughter that was born at the time. And there was an instance where Grandpa Michael said to my sister and I, we were driving from a, an event where my dad was getting an award. And Ed Koch was the mayor at the time. And he said uh, everything about my grandfather, about what he did. And my grandfather in the car turned around to us and he said, I did that for you. I did that for you. I did that for one day. You girls are going to have girls, or, or or somebody else is going to have children. And I did that for my grandchildren and my great grandchildren because I never ever wanted them to have a back alley abortion. And at the time, a twelve-year-old, I I didn't know what that means. But as we've all grown up, it has been a force in how we live our lives and I want to thank you for representing him in truly the most amazing way. So thank you for making the film. I would be remiss to not ask a question from that. So for the deciding vote team, um, what did you learn about making a personal story? Um, as we can see there are people in the audience who are directly impacted by this is their family. So what did you learn during the process? I mean, probably the same as like a lot of people up on stage where it's like, you know, it comes really about the people, you know, it, it's no, it's, you know, it's not so much about Alzheimer's, it's about Dan, it's not so much about, you know, trees, it's a, it's about Andrew's, what she or moms. Yeah, so I think it's also really just about kind of understanding and seeing the people as they live their lives amongst this. Anyone wants to add? Yeah, anybody want to add something about a personal story that they learned? Um, no, I mean, I think what, what's great about being here with, with you all is everyone here is in the same filmmaker mindset. These are stories that take you into a big issue through a very small personal lens. And it's definitely the lesson I've learned over years of making a lot of mistakes. 
along the way. And just tell a story. Don't try to say everything. It's not a Wikipedia article, right? <laughs> and and that, that's, I mean, and I'm, I'm honored to be in everybody's company. I thought you both were awesome. Mm -hmm. and we have another audience question. Yeah. Um, yes, right here. I have a question for Andrew. Um, well, I have, it's kind of a two-parter. The first one's a yes or no. I noticed that Nalini, one of the trees, was named after her uh, like, climbing assistant, yeah, Kaylor. So my first question is, did she name anything after you? <laughs> <laughs> my second question was, what was the um, decision like to include the extremely personal yeah. and traumatic part of Nalini's life? What was that like for you? Mm -hmm. Has she seen the film, and how do you? How does that change your dynamic as aunt and? Um, so wow. did um, Nalini name anything after you in the forest? And then second question: um, There's some pretty personal traumatic moments. So mm -hmm. how has that changed your relationship with your aunt? Yeah, thank you. Those are great questions. She hasn't named anything after me, uh, but a fun fact is that. Her husband, Jack, is an entomologist and ant scientist, he studies <laughs> ants. He's discovered many, many new species of ants, and he's named these species of ants after each one of the family. So there's a Nalinius cryptus, which I've probably gotten wrong, but it's a canopy ant. So she's had an ant named after her, um, and she is my aunt in a different sense. Uh, I just thought of that. Um, and then um, in terms of the personal element, um, there was so many factors that went into exploring you know, what had happened in her life, in her family, in our family, what the ripple effects were, and all the different perspectives, because I interviewed all these different people, her siblings, in the family, my own father, who's her brother, uh, and the way that they sort of see their parents, and um, there was a lot of, those conversations catalyzed a lot of new conversations within the family. In a positive way, I'm really glad that opening up some of those wounds allowed for some healing. Nalini has seen the film many times. Um, she um, had a, a hand in seeing it before we premiered uh, at Big Sky, and she's been with us at a couple festivals and a couple community screenings. And she's gotten a lot of validation for her vulnerability, which is different from mm. the public version of herself she was presenting before. Um, and I think the way you know I've been affected by it is that she was so open and vulnerable with me in sharing her traumatic story that it created space of reciprocity for me to be able to open up and discover and, and, and think about new things of myself that I was still working out wow. and to share them with my family before they were all figured out that wow. kind of, I was still in process just as she's still in process. Thank you so much for that question. Do we have another audience question? Yes, over here. Um, please indulge me, I'm sorry this is not a question, but I, to Dan, um, thank you. As a, as a son who, whose father is in the late stages, and as I reflect over uh, when he was in early stages, he very much hid, because I think he knew, and I think that you are bringing much needed information to, to give it to the world. So thank you. I, I just want to follow up on that. As, as you really hit the button on the whole reason that we wanted this film to be made, and that's because there's such a, a stigma associated with Alzheimer's that nobody talks about it <clears throat> until it's too late. Mm -hmm. And uh, as anyone who's read my book knows, and many of you may not know, the pathology in the brain in Alzheimer's starts 20 years before there yeah. are any cognitive problems. And that is, in my opinion, a period of time that is ripe for opportunity in managing the disease by attacking it before cognitive impairment starts. And uh, I was so happy that uh, Kate and David understood that and, and didn't make another um, doom and gloom film about Alzheimer's, but one that has some hope. Yes, I believe the question. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, first of all, congratulations to all the filmmakers. I'm so glad you're. I'm so glad you made these films. Uh, this was an incredible, uh, incredible lineup. My question for Avi Weider. Uh, so, 
so fantastic. Uh, you were married in Santa. I want to know, were you, were you, I, I, love, I love the story of, of how, you, how you went down there, you got the capture of the story, and, and were you surprised at, at the, the, the emotion, uh, the, the feeling of, of, of what the what representation uh, seemed to mean to, to the, the um, families who came out for, uh, uh, for Santa? And, yeah. yeah. What was that like? Um, the question was about uh, um, the emotional experience that you documented about all the black families who witnessed Santa that looked like them. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, um, it, it happened, like I said, it happened very quickly. I did not know or speak to or meet any of the Santas huh. before we showed up. And, um, and some of that uh, was kind of by design because we really wanted to drop in and have a very direct experience. Uh, you know, as someone who didn't grow up celebrating Christmas, um, all I can say is it was like Christmas magic that happened because everyone was so incredibly uh, warm and inviting and let us just see, you know, everything. Like the eating lunch, getting dressed in a hurry, you know, and I mean like when Santa Bill um, was on his lunch break and talking about, you know, what it's like to sit there in the mall where like anything could happen and you know I mean I was just blown away really um, by um, just the really very frank and stark uh, emotion that um, that just unfolded in, in front of us um, we did expect to see the joy of kids and families and I very much wanted to capture that and we wanted to capture, you know, people who weren't so psyched to see Black Santa there. Um, and that was kind of the, the, the part of it. I think that the other thing that really surprised us was um, just how many mixed families there were and how much that was just incredibly normalized. And, and people who came to the mall to take their picture of Santa and it was Black Santa, they were like, all right, let's do it, you know, and so like that was that was a, a, a surprise for us, but but it was awesome, you know. One last question. I see a keen person right in the front. Yeah. Every one of you did fantastic films, as everyone has said already. Really congratulations on all of them. I have two questions for a tattoo on the brain. One of them is for Kate and David, in terms of your own lives, since you have made this film, have you changed anything in terms of uh, prevention for as we get older? And the other is um, for, the, for the doctor, your main protagonist, I'd like to know if in your book you have specifics in terms of supplements and things a little bit more than Mediterranean diet and exercise, which I'm assuming means um, there are two questions. One for the filmmakers, any strides in the field that have been made from this film? And then for the doctor, um, is there any other supplements that you would recommend? I think the question was, have we no, changed? Have we changed our way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my, my dad uh, died of Lewy body dementia, so oh. I had a very intimate experience with this. Um, but I also happen to have high blood pressure, and I've worked for a long time on things that are good for my heart. And one of the things that I loved learning as we made this film is, is as Dr. Jagas says in the film, is what's good for your heart is also good for your brain. So I am on the train. Um, and that's what I've got to say. Dan, you know much more about the rest. Katie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think I, my diet's changed a little bit, and I'm just more you know, aware of that I could do better in, in any of the areas that you mentioned. Um, and really, honestly, I'm just a huge uh, avoider of, of the whole subject. You're having been mm -hmm. seeing people die in our family and, and, um, and, and, and absorbing the, the cultural stigma against discussing Alzheimer's. So I really, for me, this was hugely eye-opening that, that there's a whole stage that we can all consider from age 40 on. It affects everybody. No, I, I'm really embarrassed to say this, but I've forgotten what the question was for me. <laughs> <laughs> any supplements, any recommendations? I'm sorry? Any recommendations or supplements besides oh, oh, the Mediterranean? Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I do go into that in, in Tattoo on My Brain. Uh, going through uh, 
first with the things that have the best scientific evidence, and exercise is that. Um, so uh, you, you can't get off the hook. You have to get off the butt and, and get, your, you know, get your 10,000 steps or whatever you want to do. And you, want, you need to start doing that early. Number two, uh, for in terms of scientific you know, evidence for is diet. Uh, and uh, you know, anything close to a Mediterranean diet, I use, uh, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm religiously attached to the MIND diet, which is a variant. Uh, but you know, anything close to that, uh, getting rid of the red meat, and there, there's really good data for that. Uh, then you slip down to the areas that have emerging data and one to sleep. Uh, you, there's pretty good evidence that uh, those who get less than seven and a half hours of sleep are at greater risk for Alzheimer's later in life. And so that's something that you can't, unfortunately, that's the busiest time of our life is when you ought to be doing all this stuff, you know, in, in your midlife, in, in 50s. And by the time you get to be 80, uh, it's too late to, to really have much of an impact. Um, uh, what was, what am I forgetting? Uh, social. Oh yeah, the so, so then uh, uh, incre increasing, uh, or at least maintaining social and intellectual activity. And there, there's mixed evidence, but pretty good evidence that that is beneficial for reducing risk uh, of getting uh, uh, Alzheimer's later in life. And cardiovascular. Oh yeah, and, and then managing all the cardiovascular risk factors. Yeah. This is why Lois has been my partner in this whole thing. He is my brain. Did I forget anything? Well, that's going to be a big round of applause for everybody.